about in college are now <laughs> happening in the real world. Um, but more than that, I grew up in the country, um, but I lived in a city for the last 30 years um, until we moved to the Hill Country about nine years ago and fell in love with this area. Um, but I insisted my husband had to stop mowing the yard <laughs> because that was one of the advantages of moving. So I kind of um, came up with this concept as he was out of the country um, working overseas for a year and he kept asking me, have you mowed the grass? And I keep, or have you taken care of the yard? And my response was, yeah, I've been taking care of it. But I was taking care of it by not mowing it. <laughs> I was taking care of it by watching it. Um, so I came up with this concept of ungardening because none of us are getting any younger. You were talking about concrete, Debbie. Um, mm -hmm. A lot of things we're doing in our, our lives right now to make our work easier as we get older. And ungardening is one of them that we can do. Not only does it help us, it also helps the world at large because we're preserving the resources that we put into our landscape and we're working with nature instead of against it. So we can advance to the next slide. Okay. Oops. Well, that's a better I'm picture now. I'm zooming. <laughs> that's not what I meant to do. Okay. Nope. Move. No. Around so we can get the in the ah, there we go. That's my magic. Okay. We'll do so that. I'm I invented on gardening. I don't think I invented it. I think there's a lot of people doing it. They just don't, we don't have a club and we're not together. Um, but we have uh, the act of tending a garden or cultivating it is called gardening. And a garden is by definition, a plot of ground where we put things into it. We well cultivate it and it can be a container, a variety of plants. For me, ungardening is not cultivating. It's creating growing spaces that we put together in conjunction with the natural processes already in place in our yard. So go ahead next. Oops. There we go. Okay. So I think a lot of it evolves from our concept of beauty. I was at the Smithsonian a couple of years ago and I, they had a whole section there about gardening. And I thought it was interesting because lawn mowers and the concept of lawn is something that evolved in the early 1900s. It wasn't something that existed in pioneer times. Um, it wasn't even something that existed uh, in our European background, except in the essence of uh, garden for the purpose. In other words, herbs, vegetables, um, food for something. Um, lawns don't contribute anything to that. So I, I created this slide not to answer these questions, but to ask them, and everyone has to kind of ask them in their own heart and in their own situation. Um, why do you have a lawn? If you have a lawn, um, what does it equate to? I think a lot of times my husband was very nervous about transitioning to the yard that we had because he envisioned our neighbors uh, <laughs> colluding against us and saying, what are you doing? You know, because they have lawns and we don't. Um, so then you come to the question of why does this kind of landscaping continue, this kind of lawn growing? Um, and how does continuing to grow these monoculture lawns affect the commons that we all share? And by that commons, I mean uh, our water resources, our air resources, um, our animal resources, our plant resources. Those are the commons, things that we own collectively that any one person's efforts can adversely or, or helpfully um, inter interact with. Um, and I have a quote at the bottom there, for those of you who have done the Lindheimer presentation with me about Ferdinand Lindheimer, this is a quote from him. Nature is beautiful, beautiful everywhere where mankind does not make it ugly. Um, and I think that some people's perception if they drive past my house would be, oh, it's ugly, why don't they take care of the yard? But to me, the picture of the yard here that you see is unattractive to me. <laughs> so you can go ahead and move. So, as an example, um, this, is, this is part of my front yard. And when I first moved in here, there was a lot of vinca covering it. They had tried to garden it, if you will. Um, it was a huge tripping hazard. It's a very steep hill, and if I wanted to do anything or check anything there, I had to look at it. So my, my process of changing this has been just to let it be, to do what it wants to do, and to remove what I don't want, in this case, the vinca. You can move next slide. And then this is an example of the kind of things that you see come up when you don't do anything on your property 
I recommend everybody waits a year when they move someplace new to see. On the left is a little uh, black uh, cherry, a little escarpment black cherry. And on the right is a spiranthes that came up um, as a volunteer on my property, which I would not have seen if I was mowing uh, aggressively, constantly. But these are the things that you see. Next slide. And I've walked this property with Leon before, so he's seen some of these places. Um, so the question is, why would you ungarden if you have these social pressures against letting things be? Why would you take the kind of unorthodox step to move towards this natural process? Well, I think it's a natural progression for supporting other environmental efforts. Um, you're not wasting resources on things. You're not wasting your money on things, number one, because I, I, from those of you who know me in my ace gardening days, um, so many times people would come in and they want pretty right away and pretty costs money and pretty usually doesn't last. And it's usually things that are not part of our environment here. And they just, they do nothing for us other than a short term bloom. And then we enjoy the dead sticks for a long time. Um, ungardening also increases your biodiversity. And I'm going to show you a list of some species I have on my property a little later. And when you ungarden, you never know what you're gonna find when you walk out into your backyard. And that can be good and can be bad. But for me, I think the constant enjoyment of something new, never knowing what I'm gonna find when I walk out is, is the compelling piece. Next slide. Okay, one second, I'm letting somebody in the meeting at the same time, there we go. Okay. It's a little slow tonight, there we go. Yeah, it's okay. So these are the kind of things uh, people always ask about, or these are the challenges to creating this growing zone that, we're, um, we, that we all want on our property. And I, I called it a wild challenge, I like acronyms. And I tried to stuff everything in there. So we're gonna cover water, invaders, light and lawn, and dirt and deer. Next slide. So we'll start with water because I think for most of us, that's a limiting factor in our gardening. Um, rain here is unpredictable. And we can get, as some of us have seen, a, a 10 inch downfall in a matter of hours, or we might not get rain for months on, an, on end. Um, what I think is amusing about this environment, um, coming here from Houston, which had a totally different rainfall amount, totally different aspect. Here, people act as though the drought is unusual. I moved here in 2011. We were under what had been, I don't know how many months of drought. I know trees were lost. A lot of plants didn't make it through that process. But people acted like that was abnormal. Well, that drought might have been abnormal, but the process of drought is entirely expected. And I'm always amused by the weathercasters, the, the, the uh, weathermen on, or weather ladies, who say, well, now the drought's over. No, it's not. The drought is as reasonable and as expected as the rainfall. It's going to happen over and over again. For us to continue to pull up groundwater, we have to remember that we're mining something that's not being replaced or replenished at the level that we are uh, removing it. Uh, the, the recharge rate for the Trinity Aquifer is somewhere between 20, 10 and 50 thousand years. So just because it rained yesterday and, and uh, San Antonio got a jump in their aquifers doesn't mean that you and I are going to see a jump in our aquifer. Ours happened 10,000 years ago, back when the mammoths were walking around here. Um, so you need to teach your plants to find their water. <clears throat> and you need to pick plants that are going to choose or that are going to know how to find that water. Um, but oftentimes people have a watering philosophy that um, subverts their plants best health and best interest. They go out and they're in the ground and they water their plants a little bit every day, a little bit every day. And what that teaches the roots to go upwards towards the surface as opposed to following the water as it drains down. So I might recommendation to anybody, whatever plants you're going to put in, teach them to find their water deep. Water deeply and then let that water percolate all the way down. Your roots will then try to follow that water as it migrates down. And then when you when you water again, do the same thing. Infrequent, deep water. That's my recommendation. And then also select those plants that know how to adapt to a semi-arid climate. Um, I recommend also on the water side, if you're going for biodiversity, to put in a water source for wildlife. 
um, doesn't have to be anything major. On my property, it's a drip. I mean, it's literally a drip that fills a little stone basin. And it's enough that the birds can come and find something. It's enough that I'm sure everything, I've seen snakes down there occasionally, not a lot, but uh, frogs, whatever, uh, it's something that gives them a little bit of uh, respite from the dry environment. And we've actually dried up a lot of their natural water sources. Um, this gives them a chance. And the last statement on this slide, um, human population is increasing. Our rainfall amounts in the area is not. So you keep crowding more and more people in here and we have to share this rainfall or our groundwater. Um, something's got to give. So whatever we can do to take pressures off by not creating uh, water, high water use plants is very helpful. Next slide. By the end of this presentation, Debbie will be anticipating the slide movement. We'll be all trained. <laughs> um, the other, the I in the wild is invaders. Um, not only do we not have spaces where we're putting our native plants, but the places where the native plants have are under attack by invaders. The worst one I have in my yard is uh, Torlus arvensis, the one with the little stickers. People call it beggar's ticks, but um, there's a lot of beggar ticks named out there. So um, the thing to remember about once an invader gets started, you're never going to be 100% effective. Uh, the best thing you can do is buy some time for the ecosystem that's being invaded to adapt to it, but don't let's encourage it. And I know I'm preaching to the choir on this because you guys are all Native Plant Society people. Um, don't put an alien into your property. I mean, at Ace, we sold Vitex, um, which, eh, you know, maybe not. We didn't sell some other plants like Nandinas. Um, uh, these things will come to your property if your neighbor has them. One of the things that makes me cringe in my neighborhood is I see my neighbors planting um, oriental honeysuckle. And I don't know if you've got any in your neighborhoods, but I helped a lady who was trying to renovate her backyard. She had so much oriental honeysuckle that had literally eaten 30% of her property. If you go out east and drive down the highways, open your window, you'll smell it. It smells gorgeous and lovely in the spring times, but you can find nothing else in some areas, uh, like we were going through Virginia, North Carolina, um, it's eaten the entire roadside. I think it's, a, it's as bad a problem as kudzu because it stays at the ground level and completely takes over the, the surface. Um, so we have 5,000 native Texas plants. It, it's incumbent on us to use those. Um, and remember that it's not just plant invaders that we're talking about. There's also invasive uh, animals that are being put in, non-native fish, mussels, um, all kinds of bad things out there. So the less things we do to bring in from other places, the better off Texas will be. Next slide. So just a little thing, I need an L. So I did L uh, in light in this case. Um, one of the funny things in looking at garden centers is when you go to buy a plant, oftentimes your plant will tell you the light exposure that it will handle. And I have found those light exposures to be entirely inaccurate for Texas. Full sun in Texas is an environment that most plants just are not ready to handle. <laughs> so if you are selecting plants and they come from somewhere else, make sure that you, you test them before you throw them out onto their own resources. Um, and, and that said, another thing is to make sure that you buy plants that are locally sourced. If you buy um, a Zexmenia, for instance, or a, a Flamacanthus, and it's grown in Iowa or it's grown in Michigan, it's gonna have a different genetic component than one that's grown locally. Not that genetically they wouldn't parse out the same way, but the epigenetics, epigenet the way the genes are expressed are gonna be different in a plant that's grown in a different environment. So going to a big box store and picking up something that was grown maybe in the Northwest or the Northeast might not be your best way to spend money. Um, and then also, I'm a big proponent of darkness. Um, I just, it really kind of <laughs> irritates me that everybody's got to light up their landscape. Um, we need darkness at night. It's part of our biodiversity. Our plants and animals, even our own bodies, are triggered for different cycles by having complete darkness. Um, and if we give up that, or if we prevent that on our property, we lose all of our nighttime inhabitants that we might really like. For instance, luna moths. When's the last time you saw a luna moth? When I grew up in the country, they were everywhere. Now, nowhere, because they're all ending up mating with somebody's streetlight someplace, and we don't have them anymore. 
So that's light. The next one's gonna be the more compelling L, which is lawns. So lawns, I really hate lawns. I, I was running in the neighborhood the other day and my neighbor was mowing his lawn. It's a new neighbor. <clears throat> and of course, new neighbors, they always want to put in sod and then they want to water their sod and then they have to mow their sod. So not only do you have to put up with them, anyway, <laughs> just saying. Um, so as I'm running past, I yell, if you don't water it, you won't have to mow it. <laughs> And then later I talked with him because we were walking at the same time and he says, you know, it took me two hours to mow that yesterday. I said, well, as I pointed out, if you don't water it, <laughs> you won't have to mow it and you can choose other things instead. Um, and people know my house because they're like, oh yeah, your house is the one with all the blue bonnets and the flowers in it. Yeah, that's why. It's not a monoculture. So monocultures are traditionally hard to maintain. Uh, unfortunately, most of our agriculture is grown that way, but at the expense of a lot of chemicals and a lot of intensive fertilization. Uh, but more than that, they create huge deserts. So the picture you see here with the house is actually a desert. There is nothing there but whatever sod grass that is and whatever pests live on that sod grass. There's no food for native plants, there's no or, or native animals, there's no food for native insects, and it's extremely labor intensive to in, in uh, keep that golf course going like that. And as we get older again, why? Why do you want that labor intensive place? Now, I will say, as a, an aside, there are people who need lawns. Some people want a pet lawn or they need a child lawn. And there are certain reasons why you might want a lawn. But I have to say, from my opinion, no one needs the lawn that you see in this picture. Um, the other thing is they're non-native and invasive. Uh, whoever put together my property here added Bermuda grass to the mix. I'm sure they did it because they needed something to cover where they put in the septic tank. Um, but the problem is now I have invasive Bermuda grass trying to grow everywhere and that stuff is just, ugh, it's horrible. Um, they're expensive. And as we're gonna see in the next slide, they're also hazardous. And not just because you get a heart attack while you're running your lawnmower. Um, here's the expense side. This is, I know, a little eye chart, but fortunately we're all close to our screens as opposed to being up in, a, in an auditorium. The huge amount of money and the huge amount of water spent on lawns is just not justified. And then if you go down to the middle of this slide, 32 pesticides that are routinely used by the major lawn service companies are either um, hazardous to our endocrine and our reproductive um, or they're carcinogens, and all of them present threats to the organisms besides the ones that are tapped into in the lawn. It was funny because I had, uh, my neighbor gets lawn care, and um, she doesn't have a very big lawn. It's about the size of a pool table, honestly. It's very small, um, but she has lawn care. And her guy was new one day, and he stops at my yard, and he walks in, and I can see him looking around like, I don't think I'm in the right place. <laughs> and I'm like, no. <laughs> And when I give this presentation um, to high schools, I've had a couple kids come up afterwards and say, can I take a picture of this slide? Because I need to show this to my parents because they're the ones mowing the lawn and they don't want to do it anymore. Um, but another interesting fact, um, 17 million gallons of gas spilled annually just refilling our lawnmowers. And we only spilled 10.8 million uh, when the Exxon Valdez crashed. So a huge, huge waste and toxic. Oh, oops, great. Okay, are we good? Yeah, yeah, we're good. Okay. I wish everybody who wanted a lawn could see this one slide. I know. <laughs> it's a lot of big numbers. Okay. Um, and then this slide. So, and just so you know, I'm not making these slides up. The, this is an older slide. I need to get an updated one. Um, 2003, this came from the irrigation survey by the US Department of Agriculture, showing the acre feet of water used per year on different crops and the lawn strip, outstrips all of them. And what do you get out of a lawn except for a sore back? So um, the great thing about native plants, obviously, once a native plant is, uh, is established, you don't have to worry about it anymore. It, it, it's there. And if you do happen to lose one by some chance, you know, rain comes, doesn't come that year, it's easy, it propagates itself. So chances are you don't get it, but you'll get its cousins or its nephews or something else. So 
So the D in our wild is dirt, dirt, the dirt on dirt. Um, oftentimes people coming here from other places will want to make this place look like the place they came from, to which I'm always confused and I say, so you moved to the Texas Hill Country because you thought it was beautiful and now you want it to look like Houston or you want it to look like Michigan or you want it to look like fill in the blank. Yes, I understand there are things we can't grow here. And so people will try to amend their soil so that they can grow those things. Why can't we grow things here? Because we're a calcium-based soil. For those of you who've been to the gorge and you know all of our, our calcium carbonate deposits here, high pH soil. So you can't grow some things here, print you know, like azaleas and lilacs and you know there's all kinds of other things you can't grow here. Um, putting soil amendments on, hoping that you can grow a black a blueberry bush in your backyard is just just take that money and give it to a charity because <laughs> it's not going to create a blueberry bush. Um, and then another time, people I've seen people who when they're doing their clearing and we have I could talk a whole bunch of time about clearing, they create a berm pile. Um, because that's going to help them and they think the ashes they're going to spread around. Unfortunately, if the berm pile reaches a certain temperature, it can sterilize the soil and then you have a huge area that you cannot actually grow anything on anymore, depending on the temperature. Soil is slow to deposit, slow to be created and fast to wash away. Our dirt defines our ecosystem. So the plants that grow here, grow here because of their interaction and their evolution to match the dirt that they're growing in. That means, again, you can't just go out and pick a plant and drop it in someplace and with your human hubris think that, yeah, we can make that grow here. Dirt is more important than you are in the whole scope of getting something to grow. Um, and it's because it more than meets the eye and this is where microbiology comes in because we have so many things inside the soil that we can't see. They're now learning more and more about how the fungal elements and the, um, the mycorrhizal component of the soil dictates what the plants will do and how well they'll grow and how well they interact with other elements and other plants in the soil. So good soil, and good soil that's well integrated with an ecosystem is extremely precious. And it's also a huge reservoir for future plants because if any of you who've known who turn over some soil and suddenly give it light and, and air, and it gets out from underneath, like we just lost a huge tree in our yard, which is sad, but I'm really kind of in some ways looking forward to the things that will come up now out of the seed bank that's been stored in that soil for the future. And when I talk about dirt, I guess we probably want to talk about mulch. So people always ask about mulch. Um, I am not a big proponent of mulch, except as it occurs naturally. Um, for a number of reasons, but I don't think I'm gonna go into that here. I think we'll save that for the end if anybody wants to ask that question. It's really hard to talk without seeing anyone's faces and knowing if you're all glazed over at this point or you've gone to get a beer or something. Um, so the D, the other D is deer. Um, you cannot talk about gardening or even having plants or a yard in the Texas Hill Country without addressing the issue of deer. Um, why do we have so many? because there's no natural predators. Cars don't count and hunters don't count. They're not natural predators. People are really uh, bold, I guess, about um, removing all natural predators. We don't want anything <laughs> to be a threat to us, which is understandable, but then we let these other populations just continue to increase. There's good evidence that we have maybe, well, we have at least an order of magnitude more deer in the state of Texas, maybe not an order of magnitude, let's go two or three times, than the deer we had in the 1800s and, and then increased from the 1700s. I mean, before people, deer were not as prevalent as they are now. Um, and then we have the people who want to feed deer. So I'm hoping that none of you are out there, and if you are in the audience right now, I'm going to offend you most likely. Um, Long-term feeding of deer creates long-term problems for the environment and for the people that share the space with the deer. And it creates problems for the deer. And it's always funny when I was at the garden center, people would say, well, I want, they always want the same thing. They want a plant that blooms continually, um, is perennial, uh, evergreen, and deer don't eat it. And so I take them over and I show them a plastic flower I have in the corner of the garden center and say, this will work for you <laughs> because nothing else will. Um, it, we, I was kind of snickering when you were asking Leon, does the, does the alma vine get eaten by deer? Deer will eat every green thing there is, even things that 
it will ultimately kill them if it solves the short-term problem of having an empty stomach. They will strip the bark off trees as high as they can climb up with their front hooves. They will pull siding off buildings, hoping that some part of it might be edible. There's just nothing they won't eat. There's a, there's a hierarchy of things that they like better, but if you're looking for something they won't eat, if your population gets high enough, they will eat everything. Um, so having too many of them, also you're gonna have conflicts with vehicles, which is neither good for the deer, nor the vehicles, nor the people involved in them. Um, and there's disease transfer. This coronavirus thing you're seeing, okay, comes from this kind of interaction of wild animals with domesticated and people, domesticated animals and people. You get a disease jump from a diseased population. You get two stressed populations, a stressed wild population and a stressed domesticated population. A lot of times it happens in factory farms where the, where the disease jumps into a factory farm. That's your SARS and your MERS came from that. Um, but Anytime you have a wild population that's stressed too close to people, you have the chance for this disease transfer to happen. I don't like that. Um, of course, there's landscape damage, and then you get the dependency issue. So this year, you're feeding two deer. Next year, you've got four deer. The year after that, you've got eight. After that, you've got 16, then 32. It's a very short time deer are gonna cover the world. Um, anyway, you can't feed as many deer, and you have to let nature take its course. Some of them need to starve to death. Some of them should be shot. If you look at the Agriculture Department or the Department of um, Wildlife, 25% uh, of a population should be culled every year in order to keep it healthy. And that's typically not happening around our lake here. Um, aggressive behavior. I had a lady who was telling me she was out weed eating in her front yard and the wire or the string on her weed eater was clicking against a rock. And all of a sudden here comes a buck deer and it's mating season, a rutting season. <clears throat> and he comes out, you know, very threatening because he thinks it's a sound of a buck brushing its antlers. Um, and so we just don't need to, I've heard of them attacking runners. I carried pepper spray in the springtime. Um, and when you have, as we mentioned about this disease transfer, huge populations, you're actually not helping the deer. They get declining health, they get smaller and smaller, and then you focus on mass die-offs um, and, and illnesses that come in. I've had people come when I'm doing tours and other places say, why are your deer so small here? I said, they're white-tailed deer just like every place else. You're just seeing the ones that hang out where they get fed corn. And let's just say right up front, corn is not food for deer. Corn is something they'll eat just like your kids would eat Snickers or your grandkids would eat Snickers all day long. You wouldn't expect them to grow up nice and healthy eating Snickers though. And, just be, and then the one lady says, but it says deer corn. I'm like, yes, <laughs> that's a marketing ploy. That doesn't mean that it's good for you any more than, you know, cornflakes are good for you in the morning, depending on how you look at it. Um, so deer and corn, and corn actually kills deer. Um, it just kills them slower in some places than others. They're not, they're ruminants. They're not made, to, are not ruminants, but they're, they're not made to eat corn. Okay, enough of that. Moving on. <laughs> I could go on about deer for a long time because like you can tell I'm getting worked up about it. All right, so what are the elements of ungardening? What if you wanted to look at your yard right now and start ungardening? So these are the, the ways kind of stepping into it slowly. Um, first of all, uh, there's no acronym for this one, <laughs> but we're gonna step through these one by one. So we'll go ahead to the next slide. Okay, the first thing you want to do is take inventory of what you've got because you're not going to be, for the most part, running to the store to fill in spaces. What you want to do is give what you've got what it needs to do what it's doing better or make space for it or prevent it from being crowded out by an invader. Um, so you might not want to start with your entire yard. That's what size means in this case. Size is important. Um, you might not want to start with trying to increase your whole, do your whole yard as an ungarden space. You also want to look for potential hazards in your area um, that you need to be aware of. If you, if you do this, are you going to prevent access to something, for instance? Um, how are your neighbors going to react? Maybe you start with something in the backyard and you sell them slowly on the process before you move to your whole front yard. And it, not like me. I'm not saying do it like me because I just didn't care and I don't have real close neighbors. Um, and you want to look at the physical attributes that you have in your property. 
um, microclimate zones because one side of the house might stay cooler than the other, and then watch your seasonal variations. Where does the light fall in the summertime? Where does it fall in the springtime? Where can you put something that might work here but not work over there? You really need to see your property for at least a year and watch it carefully and maybe take some notes on it so that you can remember what you could put there or what you could help grow there in the future. And then look at what your existing hard surfaces are. I know people say, well, nothing grows there. Okay, so nothing grows there. Well, let's put a big rock there. Rocks are great. I love rocks. So let's put some rocks there. Let's use the rocks we have and make them nicer for the property. Maybe scoop them all together and put more plants around them. I don't know. But something that's not going to take ongoing work to keep it going. Okay, next slide. And then after you've done your inventory, what are the tools you have? Now you're going to evaluate personally, how does this look for you? First of all, you have to set your tolerances. So, and I have to tell you, all, these pictures that I'm showing you are pictures from my yard. For the most part, these are pictures I took of things that I have or places I've been or things I do. Um, so I came home one day and there was this gorgeous rough green snake next to where I got out of my car. And I thought my neighbor had put it there because he's, he's, <laughs> he has fake snakes in his yard. And I thought, well, he probably brought a fake snake and threw it in here. And then it moved and I thought, oh, aren't you gorgeous? Um, my husband, by contrast, does not care for snakes and came out one day and found one snuggled up inside the log that we use for a bench out in the front yard and was not happy about it. None of these, these are poisonous. But you also have to address your, your comfort, comfort with certain types of animals being close to your house if you choose to be unguarded. Um, and family needs. We talked about maybe you need a little yard for the kids to run around in or your grandkids. Or maybe you need a little yard for your pets to use. That's okay. I mean, lawns are for that if you need that. Um, evaluate what you need and, and create what makes you comfortable. Um, look for your wildlife potential. We've got foxes this year in spades. We didn't have them before, but this year they're everywhere, it seems like. Um, don't block off with um, brush and such anything that has a service requirement on your property, uh, a meter or a septic tank or access to a septic tank. And consider how comfortable you are with public and private visibility to this space. But overall, what I want you to think about is what does your land want to be when it grows up? because you can't make a grassland into a forest or a forest into a grassland. So think about what the Climax community looks like in the property you're trying to amend. Next slide. And then you start with your plan. And you know, all of this is more effort than what I really did with mine. I basically just did nothing. But for people who like a plan, make a plan. Um, you might say this year I'm gonna work a Okay, I'm back. Can you hear me again? Um, the size that you're going to work with um, is part of the plan. You can do it all. You can do a small piece of it. Um, figure out your water. Use your rocks. Think about the colors you want to bring into the area. If you have plants that you don't, if you want plants that are not in your area, think about the colors, the layers, and the boundaries between different types of um, areas on your property. You might have some heavily shaded some lots of sun. If you're gonna bring in a new plant, what is it gonna give you? Is it gonna give you a food source, habitat? If you put in large plants, how much do you wanna invest in a spot where you're not sure they're gonna grow? I always put small in and go from there. And then think about the ultimate growth habits. Is it a trailer? Does it get tall? Will it block a view if you put it in now? Will it block a neighbor's view? Some things to think about. Also, I put in the property code that was uh, set up in Texas. Nobody can keep you from putting in drought-resistant uh, landscaping. Doesn't matter what their HOA says. Next slide. And then you get down to selecting plants. If the plants that you want aren't already on your property, it's always easier to select out the plants that don't belong there and keep the ones you want. It's kind of like making a team. Somebody asks, well, how do you make a team? You get rid of the people who are not part of the team. <laughs> In this case, you get rid of the plants that are not part of your scope for here. But if you are going to bring in some good plants, think about the support they're going to provide for the environment that you're bringing into. Food, nesting, shelter. Create these layers. And by layers, I mean 
a lot of people have um, what I consider to be an empty room. They have a ceiling and a floor and sometimes some walls, but they have no furniture on their yard. And by that they have trees, a canopy, they have walls, they have a fence, and they have a floor, they have a lawn, but there's no furniture, there's no bushes, there's no areas for things to come and go. Um, the nesting and the habitat for birds is not there. Um, we have foxes come very comfortably and they'll come within a few feet of us because they know they can escape very quickly back into a dense undergrowth that we've created in, in some of the areas here. So that's important if you wanna attract biodiversity. If you put a new plant in also, make sure you save space for the mature plant because I am guilty of this probably more than anyone else. It's so cute and I want another cute one right next to it, but unfortunately they're both gonna be three feet wide. And then I'm gonna to have to choose which one I keep. So think of time. Also, time is the one thing that nature has that we don't. She can take millions of years to get to where she wants to go. We, by contrast, are lucky to get 100. Um, and people want immediate gratification. I say, if you're gonna select a plant, be willing to ride with it for at least four years. I put in, some of you heard this story, I put in a little um, beauty berry. It had three stems about a foot long for three years. And I kept thinking, wow, I put it in the wrong place. It just didn't belong there. What was I thinking? And the fourth year it doubled in size. And now it's three by six probably. Um, but it needed time to build its foundation before it, it, it put down its, its foundation before it built its superstructure. So it built roots before it built the top. So, but if I hadn't left space or if I hadn't waited, I wouldn't have the beautiful plant I have now. Stay with your ecosystem. Just because an ecoregion says Texas doesn't mean it's the Hill Country ecoregion. So recommend that. Limit yourself to plants that don't require all these special requirements like soil amendments, more water, special temperatures. You can see my, if, for those of you who heard here at the beginning, you saw my crazy plant. I have a lot of crazy plants, but they're all inside plants and they don't need any outside changes. So they're easy to take care of. If you're gonna add something to, in addition to considering colors and layers, consider bloom and fruiting time. So there's always something interesting to go out and see. And then of course, match it to what's available. No matter how much I want a desert willow, I don't have a place for it on my property that I can find a place where it can grow. I'm still working on it. But there are just gonna be some times where you don't get the match that you can put things together with. And by unfriendly plants, I mean things that have a lot of spikes and thorns. Excuse me. <coughs> Don't put your cactus next to your front door. Even yuccas are kind of unfriendly there. So give them space. They're beautiful though. Next slide. And then how do you control the space? For the most part, what you're controlling is invaders and any, any amendments that you're gonna put in. And this is, a, this is an extreme case. This is a, a straw bed where they basically put, a straw, put straw and then planted the plants into the straw with a little bit of soil amendments. <clears throat> Just showing how much you can put control on an environment and still have something that's sustainable and works for the environment. But my most, uh, my, my biggest warning is make sure you don't leave unexposed soil because that's gonna wash away and you're gonna lose it completely. Um, and if you do want to add to the, what you've got there, go ahead and compost it, blend it in though, um, and keep all of your materials from your onsite because anytime you bring in new soil or new amendments from offsite, you have the potential to bring in um, invaders because they'll, they'll hitchhike as seeds, as insect pests, usually not as animals, but those two in, in themselves can be a problem. Next. And when you start removing, um, be careful, remove less as opposed to more. This is an area where I was trying to stop erosion that was going on because the mowing was cutting the grass so close. So I created this double-edged rock and then lined it on one side well, yeah, two sides with landscape fabric to keep the soil from washing away. Because until the, the, the soil is held by roots, you're gonna lose all that soil and then you're even worse than you were before you started to amend. That's an argument for starting small and then letting things stay in place on the area. There was nothing here that I could salvage to keep onto the soil, 
But if you're adding plants onto something, when you take this other thing out, leave it where it is so it can just contribute back to the soil. Um, and don't use chemical methods. <clears throat> we do have some poison ivy on my property and my husband's like, let's just spray it with a Roundup. And that would be great if Roundup worked, but I can, I'm here to tell you that I've tried Roundup in some, like on Tree of Heaven, for instance, or not, yeah, Tree of Heaven, yeah. Um, and you're still, you still need to pull it. There's, there's no magic wand for removing something that's really, really bad. And before you start removing, think carefully, know what you're removing. You can't, here's my rule, I can't pull anything out and kill it until I know what it is. And I'm, I hate, like red wasps. I've always hated red wasps since I moved here because they're so aggressive. But if you notice carefully the picture here, what that wasp is doing is actually killing a caterpillar, a looper on a cabbage. And they also will pick up the ones off the um, tomato plants as well. So, and they're, they're fascinating to watch. So I've gained a new appreciation for red wasps. I still like them to stay far away from me, but trying to get rid of all of something on your property is usually a bad idea. And it includes red wasps. Okay. All right, and then how do you protect it? Because you are going to have deer and there are going to be kinds of things that you need to protect. Um, a lot of people put up wire fences and I have some wire around my property too, but I'm also lazy and if I'm cutting or I'm picking up sticks, I pile them over top of, like this is black dahlia that you see on there that I'm just threw some sticks over it. I don't care if they're loosely piled, um, and my husband hates them. He's like, what's underneath these sticks? Is there something, he can't move a stick in the yard because he's afraid he's gonna move something that's critical. Um, I've got him trained. And, uh, but anyway, uh, the deer, if they put their head in there, the sticks collapse and they don't like that, nor will they step through sticks. They don't like stepping through sticks and they don't like to get their heads caught into inside small spaces. Um, so these kind of things can work as barriers. Um, if you have dogs, um, you know, know that dogs will eat and chew and you might have to be careful about uh, what kind of plants you put in because some of them can be toxic. Um, dogs, however, are good repellents and protectors of your property because their poop makes other animals stay farther away. Um, you can use repellents. I've never found them to be especially useful, or especially helpful. Um, at the point that you decide you need a repellent, like a, like a, uh, a urine repellent or some of those uh, mothballs or things you throw in the yard, probably your pest population, and by that I mean deer, is so high that they're going to choose to ignore it. Um, but they won't ignore these kind of barriers that I'm talking about. Um, you can also try to create a zone where it's a dead end and they can't get into it. Um, in other words, a pocket in your yard. So mine's unfenced but I have um, zones where the vegetation is so thick that an animal going in there would feel dead-ended. And usually the deer won't go in there to eat because of that. Um, and this is a case where sometimes I do invest in a larger plant because if they're big enough, they won't need much help to be, uh, they'll have enough reserves to handle the predation. And then you have a picture of my um, now deceased cat because she was death on all small animals in my yard. And so I tried to limit maybe to zero all pet time outdoor if you want to keep your biodiversity strong. Next one. Oh, I also put, uh, put rocks around the base of my uh, plants because if I don't, sometimes the deer just pull the plants out. So when I'm digging my hole, I pull the rocks out at the same time. There's always rocks and stack them around the edges of the plants so that's too heavy for the deer to just pull it out. I don't know why they do that. Um, I use brush piles a lot. Um, the picture you see is a brush, a uh, loose brush piled around the base of a fig tree to keep the deer from eating it. The fig tree is much bigger now. It doesn't need much help anymore, but um, still. Or the other thing that's also part of that picture is uh, lantana bushes. Um, sadly, they're not the best native lantanas. They're the, they're the ham and eggs one, um, but they're dead branches. The deer don't like to go through them, and so they form a kind of a nurse plant, if you will. Uh, you can also use fishing line strung up between places and you don't have to have a lot of it. It just has to be something that interrupts the deer's path. They don't like running into that stuff. And I would change it periodically because then they're like, oh, I didn't know that was gonna be there. It just disrupts their pattern and changes their feeding. Um, a branch teepee that you see on there is basically just taking the fork of sticks and putting them together. Again, they collapse quickly, but I reset them and the deer don't like to go underneath it. Um, 
we talked about shrubs, uh, deterrent plants. Yeah, um, cedar, people hate cedar. Cedar is a great nurse plant because a lot of things will grow underneath it. Madrones, for example, um, certain types of small plants. My Sporanthus likes that. Um, and the deer won't go underneath there. It's too hard to get underneath there. And then of course you have native seed collection and plant propagation, which you guys all know, okay? So this is just a lot of pictures. These are, and you can snap through these at, at will, Debbie. Um, this is just like, you know, what does building a habitat look like? Here you have a place that's got furniture. And there's an example of a brush pile. I would, I make mine a little looser. This is someone else's brush pile. I make mine loose enough it can be a habitat for small animals, birds especially, um, or squirrel. You don't want them to have them get so big they become a, ha a fire hazard though. Um, this shows a transition landscape on my property. This is uh, sort of my front yard. Um, the left is a path we do weed eat because that's our movement path from one area to the next. I got feedback, I got going, feedback on. going on. And then on, and the, then right, on the right, you see the, the um, uh, so I got huge feedback going on. There we go. And then on the right, you see where the, um, this is from a couple of years ago, the shrubs are coming up and we get some ground cover of all things. Okay. And yeah, I saw the comment about agarita, that's for sure. A lot of what you see in that shrubbery is agarita. It makes a great nurse plant. And the lantanas do too. Um, so once you, you know, from far away, that looked like a very boring landscape uh, at that time of year. But when you dig down into it up close, here's the kind of things you see. And these are just snaps you can go through pretty quick. Little hedgehog cactus. And then, you know, I have an area where it's nothing but sun. And I like that. I think it's pretty. It's got a few more plants in it now because I've got a woolly butterfly bush and a uh, different kind of semiso shit sage. But you know, what's wrong with that? That's beautiful. I think it's prettier than a lawn, honestly. And this is what's also out in that sunny area. And this is someone else's property and maybe not the best example of zero scaping, but again, it shows the furniture. This is what furniture should look like. And more furniture, even though there is real furniture in there. But this is what you get. You want to have a landscape with furniture. And these are all shots from my property. The one in the upper right is a ba Texas baby blue eyes that I didn't have before. And last year, I suddenly got Texas baby blue eyes. So, yay. And just more shots. I think the lichens are so cool. Those are lichens I found. Just, wow. You know, this is what happens when you let wood do nothing but become part of the landscape. You get fireflies and you get gorgeous lichens and fungus. I challenge anybody with a lawn to take pictures like that. Um, so then this is my my eye chart kind of, <laughs> but and it's not complete because I've got a lot more things now, but this is, uh, species list that I keep just for my own entertainment of things I found on the property, which is a lot longer now, but I haven't updated it because I can't fit any more on there. But this is way more than you're going to see in your average lawn. Okay. And this is just my resource resource page, which if Debbie, if you, anybody has any specifics like where did you get that from, um, feel free to use any of that. You notice third from the bottom says feeding deer corn is not the best thing to do. Um, anyway, interesting, and I know I've taken a lot of time. If there's any questions, um, let me know. Susan, you're going to talk about mulch a little bit? Yeah, mulch. So um, I guess I'm not hugely opposed to cedar mulch, but here's an example of the conversation I had with someone. Um, I was getting ready, I was working uh, in an area, and there was a downed tree, okay, a large downed tree. And I liked that downed tree because I talked about it as part of my, tra my trail that I would 
walk through and talk about the value of a downed tree uh, to the environment. And the person who was, he says, we're gonna get rid of that because we gotta get rid of that. It's a fire hazard. At the same time, he had a huge truckload full of mulch he was gonna spread on the path. And I'm like, oh, wait a second. I'm trying to understand how this downed tree is a fire hazard, but you're gonna spread all the cedar mulch, which looks like tinder to me, um, on the paths, and that's not a fire hazard. And he said, oh, you've got a point there. Um, so cedar mulch, uh, mulch in general around a, um, a house or whatever, I, I just think of it as tinder. Um, I've not seen it be extremely uh, effective at tamping down um, existing vegetation. Now, if you have a new bed that you're creating and then you lay down fabric underneath it and then you mulch on top of it, great. The other thing though is why, why not mulch here? Our average, well I shouldn't say our average, but we can go anywhere from having 10 inches of rain at one time to having a tenth to a hundredth of an inch at a given time. And we're more likely to get that hundredth of an inch than we are to get the 10 inches. If a tenth of an inch falls on mulch, you get zero in the root zone. If it falls on the ground and on a vegetation structure that funnels it down into the ground onto the roots, you might actually get water from that. That's why these misting systems, like my neighbor has a huge misting system that creates lots of humidity in the neighborhood. But I don't think his plants get much of it because it's also on top of it. I mean, I've done it where I, I run the irrigation uh, in a mist setting for 15 minutes and then check down an inch underneath the mulch and you've got zero water underneath there. So I'm not a big fan of it. If you want to use mulch to suppress vegetation, that's a different thing. Um, but mulch changes the character of your soil as well long term. Um, I read a book about um, changing the environment of your um, garden using mulch and the guy recommended um, bringing in certain types of mulch to create that ungardened effect because the seeds that would germinate in the soil underneath that mulch is different. So that's my thing on mulch. I don't see spending money on it. If you want to get some free stuff and suppress them, yeah, go ahead. Okay, thanks. Anybody else have questions? If you have a question, feel free to unmute yourself. I know most of you are on mute. Anybody have anything else? Nobody's drinking beer. I thought I'd come back and everybody would be drinking beer. Because <laughs> you can do that you know, at your home. <laughs> you well, don't we have, have a lot of people who are not sharing their video so you know. oh that's it that's it judy's got a beer no what's that no <laughs> i have one question susan you mentioned on the useful tools slide you had and maybe i just missed it but you had hard surface mulching what is that what do you so hard surface mulching so um there are some areas where <clears throat> as you know if you've gone through a road cut we have zero topsoil. We have nothing but a huge slab of, grand, of limestone that might be up to six to 12 feet deep. Um, use that as a hard surface. And if you want to mulch top on top of that, that's rocks. You know, just get some rocks and put it on there and make it as pretty as you want with rocks. But don't, part of the beauty of the hill country is rocks. So let's use them. Um, I've had places where people are worried about uh, ground cover coming up underneath. Um, and I say, why don't you just put a big rock on it or put some hardscape on it? Sometimes that'll suppress vegetation. Or if you have a hard to kill plant, roll a rock on top of it. That'll pretty much get rid of it. There's always the other ways, like people use black mulch and all that kind of, or black uh, plastic and things. But I like rocks. I mean, you can roll them around and push them places. And, and, they, and they make nice decorative accents against your green, so. Does that answer your question? Okay. All right. It sounds real good. I'm doing the right thing at my house. Good. <laughs> yeah. You know, you guys, it's preaching to the choir to talk to you guys because you guys are all on the bandwagon. The problem I have is I've got four new neighbors. One of them's the guy who took two hours to mow his grass and then the other three built houses in the country right next to each other and then put sod in. And yeah. I'm hoping to feed the deer. Um, but, you know, those are the people I want to reach and those are the people I'm trying to, you know, have that conversation with. It's like, yeah, what does that look like for you and why do you want that? I think we're all just buying into a group uh, hallucination, if you will, that somehow a lawn is an improvement. And we all think that the, the human condition is we make things better. Well, I don't think we do. I think we sometimes make things worse. <laughs> I talked to my new neighbors uh, this past weekend and gave them a grow green book and told her what was in her yard. 
and they're moving from Clear Lake as soon as she retires. They're up here on weekends. Mm -hmm. so she's real, real excited to go through the Grow Green book and see what she can have. And I, they've got a good ground base right now. And I was real happy to hear that she's going to let the frost weeds stay once I told her what it was. Fantastic. You know, and that's sometimes all it takes is just somebody to understand the resources they already have and not overuse the resources that we all need to share, like water. I guess that's my big bugaboo. When I see somebody miswatering a half acre of lawn, I'm like, yeah, now I can't take a shower. So, <laughs> but no, I'm, you know, it's that. Yeah, and they're not going to put in any more grass than is already there, which is St. Augustine, but. And, you know, sometimes it helps if you tell people, you know, it's not an all or nothing proposition. You can, you can start small and make a segment. I talk about creating islands when I've worked with people on little landscape projects. I say, well, let's create an island. You've got a rock and nothing grows here to start with. So let's use that rock as an anchor to start an ungardening project and then build around that. And pretty soon they start to like it and they start to, you know, like I say, those pictures I took of the close-ups, you saw my yard from far away and you go, wow, she's not a very good, yeah, what's it? But then you get, you dive in and you see the complexity and the beauty that's out there. And that's to me the song. It's very infectious. We've yeah. been um, using iNaturalist to document our yard and last count, we were, we we're up to 135 species that we've documented. It's just fantastic. It, it is. It never gets boring. Last night we watched a, uh, what wasp was Rusty it? spider wasp. A rusty spider wasp dragging a wolf spider across half of the backyard area. Yeah. We just watched him for, I don't know, 20 minutes. I've <laughs> done that too, and they're just pull and pull. Yeah. Susan Bobo had a question. Did, did you see the question? She said she wanted something oh. about um, a uh, favorite plant that is relatively unknown. Yeah, so she was just asking, I think, the general population about that. Oh, favorite plant that's relatively unknown. Oh boy. Gosh, I like so many of them. I don't know. Who's out there? Who, who's, who's got a favorite? I don't, I'm partial to roadside gara. I don't know why, but I love this stuff. Yeah, you know, my problem is I like flame acanthus. That's my yard is full of flame acanthus, but it's not on, it's common. I mean, it's, it's like, but it's so durable. And if you want something that really the deer don't touch, they ignore it. They just, mm. they just don't care for it at all. But it's so beautiful and the hummingbirds love it. But it's, but you also, I don't know, it's, it's common. Yeah. Hmm. All right, well. Unless there's any more I questions. I have a comment. Uh, I yes. thought uh, that uh, Susan brought up a lot of things. I was educated mm -hmm. a lot today. I mean, like just little things about the deep watering, you know, and, and training your plants to go after that water that's going down versus shallow watering. Becky in Absolutely. the background said, listen, that's what I told you. Listen, Susan's telling you the right thing to do. Yes. Yay, Absolutely. Becky. <laughs> well, and I think a lot of people have misinformation about what aquifer are getting their water out of. They all think they get water out of the Edwards and that's not what's happening out here. And they think the Trinity aquifer works exactly the same as the Edwards and it absolutely doesn't. Yeah. So. Yeah, there's a lot of misinformation, but you know, it takes effort to, and it takes a, a desire to change that. I think we're all agents of change. I mean, I, I guess that's the advantage of us getting together and kind of going to church over it, basically. Uh, we, we go out and then we can, we can Amen. proselytize Amen. to the rest of the country and try to help improve them. And because I think it does make the world better for these people in the short term and the long term, because they don't waste money on plants that are going to die anyway, or on amendments that are not going to work. And we all benefit from the fact that they make the world a healthier place for us. So yeah, absolutely. I like well, your comment you. about light and dark, too. I mean, I never really thought about that, but people who keep their houses lit up, you know, maybe it kind of throws their plants off a little bit, their cycle, you know. Got to have darkness. Yeah, yeah. there's a cycle that all plants need, and it's important for flowering. And the insect population that pollinates, and we don't even see some of this stuff. We're, we're all into charismatic, big animals. We don't understand how these little tiny things that are so much the part of the web of life 
I was talking to Debbie when we were practicing for this and I said, sometimes what I do for this presentation is, especially when I'm talking to the uninitiated, not like you guys, I'll bring in a handful of bolts and nuts. And at the end of the, um, the presentation, I'll say, you know, I'm talking about a lot of small things and a lot of small things, they seem like they're not important. They don't make a big difference. But, and, and that's true. So while you guys were in here with this, having our presentation, I had a friend of mine go out and open up your engines and take out some small pieces of things. And I dropped them on the thing. I said, there's just some little nuts and bolts that came out of your engines, little pieces of tubing. You didn't need that whole tent. You didn't need that whole piece of tubing. We just took a piece that big. It's not a big deal. Feel free to drive home. <laughs> to understand the concept of a small thing being a critical piece of a larger whole. That's good. Mm -hmm. It's a good analogy. But I couldn't do it for your cars, so sorry. <laughs> <laughs> we appreciate that. That's okay. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Susan. Well, that was thank you, Susan. Thank you. Thank you, guys. And thank keep, keep up the good work. And hopefully we'll all get together in person at some point in the future. One day. Yep. <laughs> One day. Thanks, all right. Susan. Bye-bye. Thanks, Thank everybody. you, Susan. Thank you. Thank you.